Um, this panel is about endangered fish recovery programs in a time of climate change. I get to introduce a very good friend and neighbor to the center, Bart Miller from uh, Western Resource Advocates across the street. He's the director of the Healthy Rivers Program. When we weren't remote, being neighbors seemed more important now. <laughs> Haven't seen you for a long time, so it's great to see you in person. Um, I think this is one of our few fully in present uh, panel. So uh, Shane, Tom, Jojo, thank you for being here and I'll hand things off to Bart. Thanks so much, Alice. Um, I'll uh, just spend a couple minutes kind of framing up our final panel of the day. Um, and I'll just introduce um, my organization, Western Resource Advocates. As Alice said, we're right across the street. Uh, we're about 65 folks uh, um, spread across the southwestern US and I direct the Healthy Rivers Program. Um, the organization as a whole works a lot on climate change, on the ground solutions to climate, and rivers are kind of in the context of how we're adapting uh, to climate change because there's some significant impacts that some of which we'll talk about today. Um, just a couple weeks ago, at the end of August, I, was, I had the good fortune of going on a, a river trip through Gates of Lador. Um, and uh, several folks in the room and at this conference in person were on that same trip it was an amazing learning opportunity uh, where Mike Feebig, who you saw on the last panel, and Professor Jack Schmidt uh, were brought together some amazing scientists, uh, experts on fish, channel, uh, channelization, uh, riparian vegetation, as well as a lot of decision makers, uh, both from federal, state, and tribal government. And it was a fantastic opportunity. And the reason I bring it up is part of that trip, we floated down the Green River and by the confluence where the Yampa comes in. And that was a place where the flows in the Yampa are probably as low as they've ever been. Um, and it's a good reminder that changes in water availability, water supply, and I won't just say drought, but aridification uh, are really affecting not just tribes, cities, and irrigators, they affect rivers directly and all the, the uh, fish and wildlife that depend on them. And so there's a lot of challenges coming uh, in this realm. And uh, certainly among those are challenges to existing efforts to work on protecting uh, habitat and species. And today's panel is gonna really look at that, at the uh, recovery programs in the uh, upper Colorado River Basin. And I'm luckily uh, joined by all the folks here. Uh, I've been involved in the program for about 20 years as one of the two uh, nonprofit partners along with the Nature Conservancy. Um, but today we have panel, a panel of experts who have a wealth of experience um, and uh, managing rivers and the species that rely on them. Uh, Tom Chart will kick us off. He just stepped down as the uh, uh, director of the recovery program. And he'll describe the programs, the status of the fish and, and some of the emerging threats. Next, uh, Shane Capron. Uh, is a fish biologist with Western Area Power Administration, and um, he'll talk about that agency's role in fish recovery. And then Jojo Law, the endangered species specialist with the Colorado Water Conservation Board, will explore further climate change impacts that we uh, can expect to see and maybe some of the impacts on fish. Um, my hope today is the takeaways for all of you will be um, some of the most pressing issues that are facing endangered fish and the partners uh, uh, that work in the programs in a world that's impacted by climate change and some of the key opportunities to help the fish and uh, in the tributaries of the Colorado River. Um, before we start, Jojo was nice enough to get a couple goodie bags that we're gonna give away. Now, no one has to come running up, but I'm gonna ask two questions. Everyone can answer these at the end of the presentation. So we thought we'd ask them now at the beginning. And at the end, whoever raises their hand first, um, we'll, we'll leave them up here on the front. You can pick them up when the panel's done. So the first question is, how many federally listed endangered fish species are endemic to the Colorado River Basin? Jennifer. <laughs> four, her answer's four. That's right. Nice job, Jennifer. Okay. <laughs> Second question. It can't be Jennifer answering this. Name one of those species. <laughs> Colorado pike minnow. I'm going to give you partial credit, but you know you get it. <laughs> it's Colorado pike minnow. Um, great. Great job, Kevin. So um, first up is, so those folks, again, can pick them up at the end of the panel. I'm going to pass it off to Tom Chart. Thanks, Bart. Are we going to have access to presentations? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah, well, Sean's bringing this up. Um, recently retired from the Fish and Wildlife Service. I was the direct, director of the Upper Colorado program for about 12 years. Um, and what I'm gonna be focusing on today um, is primarily these upper basin uh, recovery programs, our program and the San Juan program, um, administered by the Fish and Wildlife Service. But don't forget, you know, there's other collaborative efforts down in the lower uh, Colorado River as well. Uh, administered by the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, Glen Canyon Dam Adaptive Management Program established in 1997, and then the Lower Colorado Multi-Species Program established in 2005 as well. But again, I'll focus mostly on the Upper, uh, upper Colorado River system. Uh, Jennifer got these four fish already. But what these thing, uh, these programs are about are these collaborative partnerships. And Kimmery was already um, talking about the importance there. We have this, this suite of partners that have been at the table since 1988 in the program that I was dealing with. Uh, we don't have the answers to climate change, but I think we're in a good position to at least process the information and um, try to work towards um, solutions as it relates to managing flows and uh, how those flows affect fish habitat as well. You can see the partners on the left there, um, federal agencies, state agencies, environmental groups, hydropower, uh, water users have a seat at the table as well too. The four fish from the top, uh, Colorado pike minnow, very good. Um, humpback chub, razorback sucker, and bony tail, uh, only found in the Colorado River system. Uh, all long-lived fish um, evolved in this highly variable system. Uh, it takes a long time for these critters to respond um, to the threat management actions that we are doing as a collaborative partnership. Again, a closer look at the upper basin. Um, two programs that we're gonna be talking about here today. Um, the Upper Colorado River program focused on the Green River and the tributaries of the Yampa, the White and the Duchesne River. Also the Colorado River and the main tributary on that side of the basin is the Gunnison River, all the way down to the inflow to Lake Powell. Um, the Upper Colorado program, again, um, tasked with trying to recover all four of these fish. Um, the San Juan program established in 1992 focuses on that main channel um, of the San Juan and that sub basin from Navajo Reservoir down to the inflow of Lake Powell. They're charged with assisting in recovery of Razorback Sucker and Colorado Pike Minnow. Um, a lot of similarities between these programs, differences in partnerships. Um, importantly, the San Juan program has strong participation between with um, four Native American tribes, the Hickory Apache, uh, Ute Mountain Ute, Southern Utes, and the Navajo Nation. And thanks to Lyle for that um, ancestral connection between the Hopi tribe as well with the San Juan program is um, very interesting. These are the program's goals. It's really um, balancing a couple of pieces of legislation, the, the law of the river and the Endangered Species Act. In other words, what we're trying to do is recover endangered fish while respecting the water development that occurs according to existing laws and uh, tribal uh, water rights. Um, and, and, and in fact, what our programs do day to day to reduce the threats and try to work towards recovering these fish, we actually provide ESA compliance for the depletion effects associated with all the water development that occurs in the green Colorado and San Juan basins. And what do we do? Uh, we kind of bend this up into these program elements, managing flows for endangered fish. From the get-go, the programs have been involved with trying to figure out the fish needs and then trying to restore inter and intra-annual variability in the hydrograph in these three sub-basins as well. Really critically important. And Jojo is going to be digging in a little bit more on this program element, but it's really a huge um, consideration of what we are trying to do out there on the landscape. Habitat development comes in a lot of forms, provide fish passage at low head diversion dams, screen irrigation canals so that we're not losing native and endangered fish um, to the irrigated fields, and then uh, reconnecting the floodplain, uh, incredibly important nursery habitat for a species like razorback sucker. Um, we are stocking uh, razorback sucker and bony tail in our program. The San Juan program is also trying to reestablish populations of Colorado pike minnow and razorback sucker down in the San Juan from the hatchery system as well. Non-native fish control, I got one more slide on that because I consider that the biggest threat and there's a real direct link, I think, with the signals we're getting from the climate scientists as it relates to those invasive species. But then central to all of this is um, a commitment in this adaptive management context to monitoring these populations to determine the effectiveness of our threat control actions and then also provide the service with the information they need about the viability of the species that lends towards 
um, reclassification of these critters from endangered to threatened and eventually to try to get these fish off the endangered species list. Again, the, the issue that our program is dealing with in the Colorado and the Green River um, subbasins are these invasive predatory species, northern pike, smallmouth bass, and walleye. Um, smallmouth bass is probably the most insidious, um, occupying about six to 700 miles of main channel and tributary habitat, self-sustaining populations. We have a multi-pronged uh, approach to trying to control these fish at reservoirs in the main channel as well through policy changes, trying to get the, the public enlisted in controlling these populations through liberalized harvest or incentivized harvest for smallmouth bass and northern pike as well. Um, and then most recently, just in 2021, we actually did a flow experiment out of Flaming Gorge um, Dam to actually try to control smallmouth bass reproduction. Shane's going to be picking up on that and talking about that experiment in the context of more experiments throughout the Colorado River system as well. But again, smallmouth bass, you know, if the signals we're getting is lower flows, earlier runoff, low base flows and warmer temperatures, that all plays into exactly what smallmouth bass love out there in the system too. So definitely a species that benefits from all those signals more than any of our native fish. How are the fish doing? Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service makes these calls. They endangered these fish. Some back at the inception of the Endangered Species Act itself, Razorback Sucker and Bony Tail were listed a little bit later, but the Fish and Wildlife Service processes the available information in terms of species needs, their current condition, and then their future condition, then they make these decisions. And then we are in the process, the Fish and Wildlife Service is in the process of downlisting humpback chub and razorback sucker right now. A final rule on humpback chub could come out any day. Um, with razorback sucker, we just closed the comment period on the proposed rule to downlist razorback sucker. Um, based on that same bit of information, the service has decided not to change the status of Colorado pikemen or bony tail. We can get into that if you'd like to as well. Um, importantly, in these decisions, an endangered species is one that is currently at risk of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range that's endangered. Threatened is one that could become endangered in the foreseeable future. The service felt like the science supported the decision to downlist humpback chub and razorback sucker. And importantly, they also have decided to update the recovery plans for three of those four species. And finally, the status of the program itself. Um, both of these programs are implemented via cooperative agreement that will expire in 2023. So we've been working on our post 2023 future. Um, the, the participants in both of these programs have committed to the same goal. Recovery is our goal. Um, we're not there yet. Um, they've also exp expressed um, unanimous support to continue these programs into the future. The sticking point is that our traditional funding source, uh, hydropower revenues, um, uh, that we've really enjoyed in terms of the annual funding since the inception of these programs is becoming much less reliable. And Shane is gonna be pointing up that issue as it relates to the basin fund as well. So Bart, that's all I had. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Shane Capron, work for Western Area Power Administration, the Colorado River Storage Project. Um, I'm a fish biologist, and um, I just want to give you a little bit of background on the on the CRISP office and, and who we are. But first, thanks to Bart for pointing out that uh, the river trip, our CRISP manager, Tim Vigil, was on that trip, and, and um, he had a really great time working with our partners and um, really came back reinvigorated and, and energized for us to work with our partners going forward. So really appreciate those, those opportunities. Um, the CRISP office is about one of uh, five regions, regional offices within the Western Area Power Administration footprint, 135 long-term customers, um, a number of, of native um, tribes and organizations, 12 major power plants, and of those, the big ones are Glen Canyon, uh, Flaming Gorge, and the Aspinall units. We produce between four or 5,000 gigawatt hours of energy per year, but also 
we supply uh, capacity and transmission and, uh, you know, and a lot of other very important um, uh, uh, products. We uh, have a number of fish biologists at CRISP and um, my kids would be uh, unimpressed me if I didn't have at least one bad pun and that we sometimes feel like we're fishes out of water working for a federal hydropower agency. But we have a very interesting role within, um, within CRISP, within WAPA, working with our partners on both the, the Upper Colorado River Endangered Fish Program as well as the Glen Canyon Dam Adaptive Management Program. And our goal within our environmental group is really to improve the conditions downstream of CRISP facilities and try to protect and improve the hydropower resource. Um, to make decisions about those um, with data-driven decisions that try to lower the cost of environmental compliance. And to us, efficacy is really important, that we, we try experiments, we figure out if they work or not, we make changes, and then we do better. And we look for win-win situations. We try to design these at the lowest cost. If we can design these experiments or flow-related actions for endangered fish that cost less, then we can do more of them, right? If they cost a lot, maybe we can't do as many. So from our perspective, let's try to find ways to minimize our costs so we can do the most um, and best work we can for endangered species. But we need to talk a little bit about finances because it's getting pretty rough out there. And for our agency, um, the last couple of years and looking forward is is um, is pretty grim. This year, our expenses are are much exceeding our revenues, and our basin fund that we use to manage the system is dropping um, about 86 million at the end of 21. Looking forward to 22 and 23, we see um, huge hydro huge um, purchase power costs to try to manage the system, such that we could potentially be in the hole minus 30 million dollars by the end of 23. That's just not possible due to the Anti-Deficiency Act. We can't let this happen. And so we are in the middle of a number of activities, including a, a raid action and other mitigation measures to try to, to deal with this situation because this can't work. What's even scarier, and I think you'll hear about it more tomorrow with the most recent um, um, hydrologic modeling coming out of reclamation last week, when we looked at it just quickly the last few days, 22, 22 of the 32 future traces that go out 10 years <clears throat> show extensive periods of time where Glen Canyon Dam goes below minimum power pool. And that's when we produce no power at Glen, which is our main resource and has huge implications for river temperature flows and all of that. So um, tomorrow will be interesting hearing more about that hydrology, I'm sure. One of the other issues that we deal with is when, as the um, lake level lowers, and this is Lake Powell, and has been lowering for a long time, hydraulic head decreases, and the energy contained or the potential energy in that water is much less. When we're at about 3,700 feet, we have about 100% efficiency going through the generators. When we're down to 3,500, which we're heading towards, um, it's about 35% less. So not only do we have less water running through the generators with the lower river flows, we also have less efficiency. So we get hit basically twice. And for the same amount of water at 3,700 feet, we produce 35% less energy um, at 3,500. So huge implications to the reservoir staying low and its impact on power. Uh, one of the cool experiments and that we've been working on for a while, um, Tom pointed out the smallmouth bass spike flow experiment um, is one we've supported for a long time. Um, and we thought wouldn't be too expensive to implement in most years. And then of course we have a dry year like this year and our estimates of cost of this experiment was much higher than we expected at $1.2 million. We implemented the experiment. We had hoped for some offsetting um, flows to help mitigate some of the cost. And this is where the win-win comes in. Higher summer flows for Colorado pike minnow are also really good for power. So it's a great opportunity for us to get a win-win there. We asked for higher summer base flows. We did not get them through the um, Flaming Gorge Working Group process. But just to give you kind of how these things can work together, the Drought Response Operations Agreement releases um, that were done this year uh, under the emergency um, criteria, 
Not only at Flaming Gorge, they increased the flows to about what we would have wanted for the Pike Minot um, base flows, but also the other units um, at Aspinall. We um, anticipate about 6.6 .6 million in offset costs that we would have had. So pretty substantial. And you can see where moving some water around can really offset some of the cost of these experiments and, and where we can look for win-win situations. We've been involved in a number of experiments over the years. Um, larval trigger, the spike flow, um, various bug flow experiments at Glen Canyon Dam. Um, some of them have been benefits. The, um, the non-native fish suppression flows were, were good for power and, and were actually on the positive side. And we were able to, through the LTEMP rod, um, design bug flow experiments that in most years um, have a pretty minimal cost compared to some of the other experiments. So there are lots of opportunities for win-wins here. And just one last um, note to get on my soapbox about recovery plan. And Tom pointed out that a number of the, the fish will be um, developing new recovery plans for them. We think this is really critical to speeding up and keeping, the, um, keeping recovery going and actually getting to the goal is to work together to come together and, and um, revise these recovery plans because they have the agreed upon goals of where we're actually going. Um, and um, we think this is really important to actually getting recovery for humpback chub and razorback suckers and the other species. And that's it, Bart. Thanks. Thanks. Hello, thank you. It's, it, I have to say there's something powerful about going last. And so thank you for <laughs> hanging on today. I know we're going a little late, but I just wanted to start by saying thank you to Bart and our host here. And wow, I just, I just have to say it's a really big honor and a privilege to be here today with this amazing set of uh, speakers. And I'm just really uh, grateful to be here today. Um, this topic of climate change is really complex and it's a really important topic. And actually we can probably spend days talking about it, which tomorrow you will. Um, so in thinking about what to discuss this afternoon, I did what any good policy advisor does and I Googled it. So when I asked Google and I Googled the top news headlines for drought in Colorado, over 100,000 results showed up. However, when I Googled threatened and endangered species in Colorado, which covers all threatened and and endangered animals and plant species in Colorado, or approximately 33 species, less than 15,000 results showed up. That means there are more than six times more news articles about the drying Colorado River than there are about all endangered species in Colorado. This led me to the question, is the Colorado River more endangered than our most endangered species? Google tells me that drought in the Colorado River is thought to be more important to the general public than endangered species in our state. But why is this? We all know that almost 40 million people rely on the Colorado River, but there are probably more individual animal species and plants that rely on the Colorado River. It's just really hard to count those individual animals. So this is really incredible because just this Wednesday, the US government declared that more than 20 different bird, fish, and other species have gone extinct. So as you heard from Tom Chart, these species are really incredible. And these are the most unique looking species that I've ever seen. Um, let me see if I can play this. So this is me drawing a humpback chub. These are, as Tom mentioned, these are very long lived species that are native to the Colorado River Basin. And they date back more than 3 million years ago. Over these millions of years, the humpback chub has adapted to Colorado's conditions. For example, over time, scientists have studied its skeletal measurements and its morphology. And we know that it has a really thick, heavy bone tissue on its head and it has a rigid bump on its head. And we think that it likely adapted that bump to navigate the strong currents of the Colorado River and its tributaries. So these are really neat species and I consider them the definition of survival and adaptation. 
However, as climate becomes more variable and drought becomes longer, we are really testing the survivability of these species. We all know that drought has dominated the Colorado River Basin, making 2021 the 21st year of warming and drying condition. This has devastated the West with very high temperatures, leaving very little water in the rivers. And we're also seeing the impact of drought on these endangered fish. We know that even though these species have evolved with the high spring peak flows and sometimes very low summer and fall base flows, there are more threats to fish now than ever before, and Tom Chart mentioned that. And these endangered fish rely on water. They get their food, air, cover, transportation from water. And this year, we've seen that direct effect on the fish. So I'm just going to name a few. One, fish crowding. That means all of the life stages of the fish are forced to be in a very small area where they have to compete with predators for food and oxygen. And they may have been, this may not have actually been an issue in the past when, for example, the Colorado pike minnow was the top predator in the Colorado River. But since that time, as Tom Chart mentioned, there are a lot more non-native fish to compete with. Low water is also very clear, which means that flow doesn't suspend and, and transport and uh, the water is not very turbid. So this means not only do they have predators in the water, but they also have predators that are on the land, including uh, birds, dog, rac dogs, raccoons, and, and et cetera. And so they hunt them too. With this low and clear water, the fish also get sunburned and are exposed to really high levels of contaminants. Lower water also fragments their habitats, which expose low head dams, making the river impassable in many cases. When we did finally get our summer monsoonal rains this year, we thought we made it through the seasons, but of course the monsoons also brought fire, debris, and, and ash. My good colleague, Del Ryden, a biologist from the Fish and Wildlife Service says, it's like taking a hundred kids of all ages and all sizes off of a school bus, packing them into a compact car uh, with the windows rolled up in the middle of summer and saying, hey, you guys sit here, you'll be good. I'll be back in two to three months. Oh, and make what food you have last until I get back. He did say that was a little dramatic, but nonetheless, I appreciated the analogy. Um, the important part is, is every drop of water matters for these fish. But we know, and as we've heard today, that in the Colorado River, we must also serve the human needs as well as the needs of the fish. And this map shows all the buckets of fish water that the recovery programs own and for the sole purpose of releasing water for the fish. We have developed strategies for long-term protections of uh, flows throughout the Colorado River Basin, and we've, re we've reduced shortages to target flows. For example, the recovery program has augmented base flows in the Colorado River during the August to October period, on average, more than 400 cubic feet per second, we have also been successful at enhancing peak flows in nearly 50% of the years with on average more than 33,000 acre feet of deliveries through voluntary coordinated reservoirs. So we've made tremendous progress on flow augmentation. So for example, this graph shows the flows in 2020 last year. The green line shows what the flows would have been without our fish water releases and the blue line shows with our releases. You can see here that in early September, the river may have gone completely dry without our water releases. However, in spite of the recovery program flow augmentations, uh, we know that flows frequently fall below our target flow. For example, in the Yampa River Basin, one of the most important tributaries in the other upper Colorado River Basin, we are learning that we're increasingly not meeting the target flows. So 2021 will be the fifth year in the past 15 years where we fell below the target. And this represents about 33% of the years where we're not meeting the target. And back in 2006, when we predicted what the future might look like, we only predicted that 4% of the years we would not be able to meet the target. So from this information, we know that drought has gotten worse. And at the same time that we are experiencing this devastating drought in Colorado, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is also telling us some key information through its sixth scientific report. The report says, it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the, the atmosphere, ocean, and land. 
Human influence has warmed the climate at a rate that is unprecedented in at least the last 2,000 years. Human-induced climate change is already affecting many weather and climate extremes in every region across the globe. And this evidence of observed changes in extremes such as heat waves, heavy precipitation, droughts, and tropical cyclones, and in particular, their attribution to human influence has strengthened. And in the Colorado River Basin, we are anticipating three key changes in flows in the future. One, we are expecting that runoff will shift earlier into the year. Two, we are expecting and modeling that drought will actually last even longer in the future. And three, we are also anticipating that crop irrigation water requirements will increase due to hotter temperatures and changes in precipitation. So most importantly, what does this all mean for the fish? In the Colorado River, we projected reduced flows through our Colorado water plan, and we project, projected those in the mid and late summer. And we predict that it'll, it, it will be difficult to meet flow recommendations. For example, August flows under climate impacted scenarios on the Colorado River suggest that flow recommendations for the endangered fish will not be met in, in August in approximately one third of the years. And in the Yampa River Basin, we are modeling that only three to 18% of flows in August will meet the target flows. Mm -hmm. Let me repeat this because this last point is really important. We have a future for the endangered fish where only 3% of the target flows will be met in August under the driest conditions. So as we're seeing a, a catastrophic changes in hydrology due to drought, we all need to work together, collaborate to come up with really creative solutions. Okay, it's a little depressing. So back to this cute guy, uh, the Razorback Sucker. As Tom mentioned, the Razorback Sucker was recently proposed to be downlisted from endangered to threatened. And I just thought I'd take a minute to tell you how far this little, little sucker has actually come. So, before the 1980s, abundant amount of razorback suckers were captured from its wide range, and that range extended all the way from Mexico to Wyoming of the Colorado River Basin. But by the time the endangered fish uh, studies began and scientists started studying them, the number of razorback suckers captured uh, decreased dramatically. In fact, there were only a few scattered adults around, and we can only capture at that time 12 individual fish, um, despite intensive collect collection efforts. By 1989, the US Fish and Wildlife Service listed the razorback sucker as endangered stating historical populations were affected by construction of multiple dams that suppress the flows and only 25% of its historical range was left from Mexico to Wyoming. So finally in 1995, the last razorback sucker was captured and uh, scientists took that in to start breeding. So these fish have really come a long way from you know, only finding 12 individuals now to being recommended to propose to downlist. So by the way, of course, I also Googled Colorado River with endangered species to see what that would come up with. And so I combined my first two searches and the top news article that came up was an article by KUNC written by my good friend, Luke Runyon. And I gave him a lot of guilt for leaving before my talk, but I didn't tell him why, but he doesn't know he's being quoted, but he says, the Colorado River is one of the most engineered river systems in the world. Over millions of years, the creatures that call the river home have adapted to the natural variability of its seasonal highs and lows. But for the past century, they have struggled to keep up with rapid changes in the river's flow and ecology. Dams throughout the watershed create barriers and alter flows that make life hard for native fish, toss in 70 non-native fish species, rapidly growing invasive riparian plants in a slurry of pollutants, and the problem of endangered fish recovery becomes more complex. Thank you for your time. I encourage all of you to do your own Google search at home to learn more about the endangered fish and the recovery program. So Alice, do we have a few minutes for a few questions? I know we've run over, but this will only. <laughs>
Well, great. So yeah, I guess I welcome questions from folks in the audience and I guess online potentially through chat. Jennifer. Thanks. That was a great panel. Definitely worth staying through the end of the day. Um, my question is about the downlisting proposal and my understanding that the upper basin recovery implementation program has a, a sunset on it and i find it curious to understand the challenges that we're facing on the river we know now with much more clarity although still a lot of uncertainty about the challenges we face um how it makes sense to down, propose downlisting a species that is facing more challenging conditions than it ever has faced, potentially, and at the same time, considering sunsetting the program that is not only allowing these species to hang on, but also giving every water user the compliance they need with federal endangered species law, how does that all add up? And, and Jennifer, I can take a first shot at that and see if the other panelists want to jump in too. Um, yeah, uh, the, the decision the Fish and Wildlife Service makes is, is science-based as it relates to the class classification. So it, it takes a look at the species needs, their current condition, and then the future condition as well. And with um, Razorback sucker, um, those populations, you know, 30,000 adults out there in the Green River system, um, San Juan, Lake Powell, populations in the lower basin as well, um, particularly in the upper basin, the trajectory of those populations is positive. And what we're seeing in terms of flow management and primarily floodplain management really factored into the Fish and Wildlife Service's decision to go back to that definition. Um, is this species at risk of extinction now? Um, and we look at the ground that we've covered through those last 30 years that Jojo was just referring to as well and the trajectory of the population with um, those Razorback suckery. And I think they're trying to be true to the definition and true to the science and say, okay, this is, this, this is what the science supports. This is the right call. Um, you know, when we took a look at Colorado pike minnow, that's a species that we've never stocked um, but unfortunately, the trajectory is is downward uh, in the Green River system and questionable over on the Colorado River side. So, you know, applying the same standards and then reviewing the same types of science, um, we couldn't go there. With respect to Razorback and Humpback Chub, you know, the service certainly pulled back from delisting, obviously. Um, and again, that, dis that de definition of a threatened species is... Um, is one that's in danger, uh, uh, at risk of a becoming endangered in the foreseeable future. Therefore, we are able to protect that species. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Service was able to protect that species even in a threatened status. So again, it, it comes back to the definitions and the science and the Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, they get, they get the opposite question um, from other folks out there that are paying attention to what's going on in the Colorado River. How can you not downlist when you have 50,000 adults out there, they're reproducing every year as well. So um, I think they were consistent um, as it relates to all those calls with humpback chub, razorback sucker as well. Um, I'm not gonna get into population de uh, demographics about humpback chub, but um, populations are trending positively in the Grand Canyon and also in the upper basin. As it relates to the future of the programs, we, we totally agree with you. And, and the services decision was based on the strong signal that we're getting from the partners in the upper basin that these programs must continue. Um, uh, I guess I feel like we have to find the solution um, and it's really coming down to a funding source. Um, but we've done the good work, I think, to describe what these programs need to look like based on the 30 years of experience that we've developed going into the future. And the service says it's just imperative that um, for a species like Raver's back sucker that is so reliant on management, um, you know, these programs must continue. So um, I, I think that that would be a fatal flaw if these programs failed and could not continue. And 
the service would probably have to back away from those decisions, but I really feel like um, we're gonna come to a solution. And Bart, can I respond a little bit to the congressional sunsetting in 2023? I think it's a really good question. And one of the things that I've witnessed over the years is one of the questions that I receive quite often is folks are not, you know, I, Jojo, I wasn't aware that the recovery program was sunsetting. And it's what I've been calling uh, kind of in the years that I've been participating this failure of silent success. These programs have been operating since, you know, 30 years, and we've kind of almost come to take it for granted where those 2,500 water projects will continue to deplete water and will work towards recovery, and the programs will go on forever being funded, you know, and supported. And so it's been a really, I think, a really good thing to remind folks that how powerful and successful and how much of a success these programs are and a really an uh, example for the nation on how two seemingly contradictory things such as water development and water that needs to stay in the stream could come together. So, you know, I don't think we've seen, we haven't heard anything other than support from all of the program partners that we are going to renew the program. And so we're just trying to figure out the details of funding sources and how the program might look. But I think we're all very committed, including the Colorado Water Conservation Board and renewing these programs. So. Yeah, the only thing I'll add to that is, um, I'm not sure this is on, but uh, when the congressional briefings happened by the non-federal partners every spring, um, I usually hadn't taken part, but I did on a few this year. And it's amazing to hear congressional staff familiar with the program and a bit of its history understand what a bargain it is. They talk about it as, oh, well, yeah, it's a few, a few million dollars a year, but we are providing endangered species coverage to literally thousands and thousands of water users, big and small, um, from municipalities to irrigators and and avoiding lawsuits uh, for at least 30 years now. So I think they see it as a pretty, pretty much of a bargain. And so I'm very much, I think as Jojo said, there's a lot of consensus around continuing the program and even at, at specific levels that are at or a little bit above what we've been spending. Well, I'm... Uh, I want to congratulate you all on the fantastic programs you're doing to study and protect the endangered fish in the Colorado River and the projects that you've, you've described. It's very impressive, and I applaud it, and I you know, support it completely. I think that uh, everybody should be proud of what you're doing. I mean, you're a scientific expertise, and I can go on and on, but my issue is how can we continue taking millions of acre feet of water from the western slope to the growing cities on the eastern slope, continuing as the climate change continues to dry up the Colorado River? And you're, you're talking about these catastrophic problems that are only going to get worse. And I don't see how we can continue doing that. But we've been doing it for 100 years. And it's just destroying the ecosystem on the western slope. It's changing the ecosystem and increasing the carrying capacity artificially on the eastern slope. And people talking about more growth. I was talking to a Colorado Springs a water official uh, maybe 30 years ago, whatever it was, and, uh, and talking about the fact that using uh, the water for the bluegrass uh, lawns and golf courses, quote, everybody wants growth. That's the ideology of a cancer cell. And it, the, the, you, you said it is unsustainable with all the people trying to use the Colorado River. So I guess my, my question is, um, I, 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 I can't applaud too much the, what you're doing. How do you see this problem? Uh, how do you see a, this problem being resolved with the cities continuing to grow on the eastern slope of Colorado? I can, I can take it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that the Bart wants to take a step. I'll take, I'll take part of it. I'll just acknowledge that the program, as, as Jojo laid it out, and I think Tom did too, it has dual purposes of both um, keeping the fish from going extinct while some, uh, some amount of additional development happens, but that's been really specific as far as how much additional depletion can occur. So the, the coverage that exists for water users in, uh, in several of these sub-basins has 
done the analysis about how much additional depletion could occur and still be able to be consistent with the program and, and be on that trajectory towards recovery. So in each basin, Colorado River main stem, for example, has an increment of depletion of 60,000 acre feet. So the assumption was made that much additional water depleted from the system could still be consistent with recovery. And the idea is after that amount is depleted, which hasn't happened yet, after that happens, you would check out and see how the fish are doing before you'd have any future. There's a second increment, but that would have to be dependent on um, doing well with their recovery. So I don't know, Jojo may have a different perspective or way to explain that. No, I, I think I agree with you, Bart. And I think that's a really good question. <laughs> I don't have all the answers to that, but what I can tell you is, you know, what I've seen over the years, it, it hasn't really been the, you know, cities versus the ag versus the fish anymore, because we realize we all rely on this water. So I've actually seen, I think Bart and Tom have actually seen all of the water sectors to come together. I mean, this year alone, with being such a dry year, we saw more water donations from municipalities, from water users than we've ever seen in the past. So it's the recognition that humans need water, but also, you know, we need water too. Um, that doesn't answer your question though, but I think the only way, the best way I could probably answer that question is we're doing a lot of planning and we're doing a lot of modeling and we're trying to look into our crystal ball. We're trying to see what the 112 traces of climate change does to our water supply. And I, I, I guess I wouldn't be a, a great CWCB employee if I didn't plug the work that we're doing with the Colorado Water Plan and the basin implementation plans. That's exactly what we're doing. We have scenarios where we're trying to plan for the future of water development in the different basins and then trying also as a very important sector to plan for the environmental needs uh, for water as well. So a lot of planning, a lot of modeling to try to figure out what solutions we might need to be able to serve, you know, one water for all, but it's, it's a really hard question. Anyone else want to take a stab at it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's the fundamental question. I mean, it's, it's huge, I think too, you know, and it's really, um, you know, the fish and wildlife service that does the um, evaluation of the program on an annual basis, they have to pass the straight face, face test is this grand bargain that we have that we can cover the water depletions that have occurred and still recover these fish um, still a viable construct and we look at it every year um, the one thing that i go back to is i look at the historical depletions how much of this trans basin water development has been in line for so long right now that it is the most developed river system in the world um, but we've seen positive responses in these fish in the face of all that historic de historical development that occurred before 1988 for the program that we were mostly talking about here as well. And what I've seen is that the amount of the increment of new depletions that have occurred throughout the, the life of the program is pretty small. And then it is this reoperation of Flaming Gorge Dam. It's the reoperation of the Aspinall unit of the upper basin river reservoirs in the Colorado River that have really squeezed flexibility out of the system to try to provide the flows that we see for the fish. So over the life of the 30 years of our program, water development continues, but we have improved the flow conditions and the habitat conditions for the fish through this collaborative partnership and what Jojo was just talking about as well. So, you know, the damage was done, I think, before we got started. The question is, is there enough left in the upper basin to, um, you know, get to self-sustaining populations out there? That's that's the, the hundred thousand, well, that's a lot more than that, but it's a big question, yeah. But it's a great question. It seems to me that an inherent vulnerability of the program is its funding source. Depending upon hydropower, I, I'd hate to think that that's, that's got to carry it in the future. And at the same time, the main beneficiaries of the program seem to be the water users. There's a disconnect there. Um, I have in the past represented water users and I would hate to put it on them to begin to pay for this, but it seems to me they should. How, how do you suggest, or what, what sources of long-term funding are you hoping for? 
I can jump in first. Um, yeah, we agree with you. Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of beneficiaries out there um, from the water development community. Um, but I, I guess in my, in my mind, I, I really feel like it comes back to um, federal uh, responsibility. Um, Reclamation's water projects really were the the reason why the states were able to develop the water that they were and allowed for this population growth to occur as well. So the, the, the path that we're working on right now is that hydropower revenues are not sustainable um, for a lot of reasons, but uh, Shane did a really good job of pointing up, you know, just how dire um, that, that funding source is going to be. But I think um, the way we are looking at it right now is that it's probably going to have to go to federal appropriations and it's going to have to be a a bureau reclamation appropriation that makes makes the programs whole the states do contribute um, the water users do contribute um, one-time depletion fee for every project they have and i think when we look through time too and, and what the states did in this analysis because this has been foremost in our post 2023 planning is how many other contributions the um, states and non-federal entities have provided to the program that go above and beyond our, our you know, our hard line funding structure as well. So um, I think the, the, the beneficiaries um, really have stepped up to the plate more than the accounting shows. Um, and the states did a pretty good job of, of putting a, a finer point on that as well. We have to trust that it's not as reliable as a go into the basin fund annually and, and pulling out that funding store. And, and an appropriation track is not gonna be as reliable in the future as well. Um, uh, we can get an authorization, but can we get the appropriation is always gonna be tricky too. Jojo. Yeah, no, the only thing I would add to that is because so much is relying on these programs and only the species, but you know, it'd be quite difficult for any water project to continue to operate without these the, this program is because of that, we value stability and um, security on an annual basis. And so when you're thinking about water user fees, they do pay those section seven fees as Tom Chart mentioned, but how do we make sure that that's continually stable each and every year? And so, you know, and also how do you ensure that it's equitable across all the four different states um, in the upper basin? So. You know, I, I think they do do their part when they when when they build a project. They do pay those depletion fees, but I think more importantly for all the partners, we want a stable source of funding. And some of these funding sources that the states provide, state of Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, um, are very hard to quantify. Right? You saw my graph with the flow contributions. How do you put a dollar amount to that? And how do you say this is the water that we're bringing to the table? it costs this much. So a lot of that water is water user water, and that's how they contribute to the program in addition to section seven fees. Do you add anything, Shane? Last question, probably. Maybe, maybe an easy question, but a follow-up to the previous gentleman. Um, Brad, you mentioned, you mentioned um, uh, or Bart, sorry, you mentioned that um, uh, the 60,000 for the main stem, some available water, and then, um, then Jojo mentioned using 113 traces. I'm curious what hydrology are you using? What do they use when they say how much water is available, and is that being adapted? Uh, now that we know reclamation is shortening their hydro hydrologic period, um, are these being being reduced or waiting until we see if this drought is... Just a drought. Really great question. <laughs> I can try to take that. So when I'm referring to the different climate changes, I am referring to the national climate changes that, you know, they mentioned all 100 and some traces are equally probable. We don't know which one is going to happen. So that's exactly what we're using in our modeling for the recovery program. We use the Colorado River Water Availability Study that relied on those climate uh, models, and we just kind of try our best to uh, try to display a range of possibilities of what might happen in the future. So that's um, what we try to incorporate in our modeling. Okay, and you said the climate models. Are you saying the, the CMIP3 models moving forward? Okay, okay. Exactly. You must be a scientist. <laughs> uh, that's a, any other response or? No, I, I just, I appreciate you pointing up, you know, the, the stress 
test modeling that Bureau of Reclamation is promoting now to that last 30 years. I think that that's really important to bring in that and be looking at you know the futures of the Colorado River system through that kind of a lens too. Um, I think that that's a step in the right direction. If you want to stop calling it stress test, start calling it the new normal. Yeah, new normal. <laughs> um, we'll wrap up, but I just wanted to say quickly, I want to thank the panel and the fact that many people in the audience here are uh, familiar with the program, help the program, support the program. And just circling back to the, the very first panels we had this morning, I feel like Though there are a lot of challenges that climate change presents to the endangered fish, uh, there are some opportunities. There are some great uh, chances for the, the continued funding and, and progress on the program. And in some ways, it's one of the gifts that we can provide the river. And so I think the work is important to continue. AM. I hope you can all return and virtual audience. We'll see you then. Thanks for hanging in there. Um, and, and thank you again. That was really, really good. Thanks. <laughs>